This segment uh, of our lecture, again, this is an instructor Gaynor talking about uh, deduction, specifically categorical syllogisms. I'm going to just reintroduce for a moment what the concept of a categorical syllogism is and follow that by uh, an example of a Venn diagram test uh, to determine whether or not a given syllogism is valid or invalid. Anyway, I'm going to define briefly what a standard form categorical syllogism is. Again, the main unit that we're working with in categorical syllogisms are what might be called categories, or if you prefer, classes of things. For example, if I have an A statement, all wallabies are marsupials. The classes I'm talking about are wallabies and marsupials and what the relationship between wallabies and marsupials is. Or if I say something like, uh, uh, so some members of the cult of Elvis are persons who live in the past. I'm talking about some members of the class, members of the cult of Elvis, also being part of the class of people who are living in the past. So I'm talking about categories of things. Could be groups of people, could be animal classifications, what have you. But the main unit we're talking about are classes or categories of things. Now a standard form categorical syllogism will contain three statements. Now recall that these statements must be of either the form A, E, I, or O. Two will be premises, and recall from earlier discussion that premises are the statements that support a conclusion. So two of the statements will be premises, one will be the conclusion. I will be, they will relate three classes or categories of things. Each class or category will be mentioned twice, but not in the same statement. So each of the three classes or categories that I'm going to be relating to one another in this argument will be mentioned twice, but not in the same statement. An extremely important part of a categorical syllogism is a part that we call the middle term. The middle term refers to the class of things that we're talking about that's mentioned in once in each of the premises. And its purpose is to connect the two premises to one another logically. Now let me show you a fairly standard example, and uh, this is going to be rather dull. I don't think I've seen a, uh, an intro to logic textbook that doesn't use some variant of this particular example. But eh, I don't mind being boring if it helps to make, uh, make an easy point. Here goes. All humans are mortals. Or are, are mortal, that's fine. All Greeks are humans. Therefore, all Greeks are mortal. Now, this is pretty common standard form categorical syllogism. And the closest structure to this that you may have encountered in propositional logic is called the hypothetical syllogism. You'll see we have an easy connection made here between uh, you know, the middle term that is in one case the, the predicate, the other case the subject. And I will tell you from the get-go that this one is valid, and we're going to go over the means of determining uh, whether or not it's valid or not. One other thing to recall is we designate syllogisms by their mood in the figure. Mood refers to the configuration of the three statements. The mood of this one is A, 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 because we have three A statements here. Now the figure 
refers to the placement of the middle term. Run through this quickly, although you can see this in various charts, but place it in your memory banks. Whenever the uh, subject of the major premise and the predicate of the minor premise is the middle term, we call that figure one. In this case, this is a triple A one syllogism. It's figure two if the middle term is the predicate of the major premise and the predicate of the minor premise. Figure three is the, the middle term is the subject of the major premise and the subject of the minor premise and rounding it out. It's figure four if the middle term is the uh, predicate of the major premise and the subject of the, of the minor premise. Now, one other nuts and bolts, if you will, uh, since I didn't mention it before. Whatever the predicate in the conclusion is, is what we call the major term. The major term will be thought, found in a standard form, that is, if it's constructed properly, uh, it will be found in, found in the first premise that we call the major premise. The subject of the conclusion we call the minor term. And the minor term will be found in the second premise that we call the minor premise. This is all just nomenclature, folks. This is all just nomenclature. It's one of those things that one just needs to uh, put into one's proverbial memory max. Now, how do we determine whether or not this one is valid? Well, we're going to use the Venn diagram method here. The Venn diagram method involves constructing three concentric circles which, which each section of the circle represents a po possible relationship among the three terms. What we'll do is we'll diagram the two premises and then we read or interpret the diagram to determine if the conclusion has been diagrammed. If that's the case, it's valid. If the conclusion has not been diagrammed in our diagramming of the premises, then the syllogism's invalid. Now, let's get to this one. Our three circles. Okay, I'm just going to call humans H. So this first circle is going to represent humans. The second circle over here is going to represent the class of all things that are mortal. And this final circle over here is going to represent the class of all things that are Greeks. Now you know that this sector one represents the things that are human but not mortal and not Greek. Two represents things that are human and mortal, but not Greek. Three represents things that are mortal, but not human nor Greek. Four represents things that are human and Greek, but not mortal. Sector five represents the things that are human, mortal, and Greek. Six represents things that are mortal and Greek, but are not human. And Seven represents things that are Greek, but neither mortal nor human. So those are all the possible relationships. Now, whenever I diagram this, I, I'll start with number one here. Diagram all humans are mortals. Like so, we are going to shade in all of the area in which there are, there are no members. So right there, I've said all humans are mortal. So all humans are also going to be part of the class of mortal things. Now, if you're wondering why am I allowed to uh, also shade out number four, because it's also Greek, keep in mind that it also intersects you know, with, uh, with things that are not in it. I've said all Greeks are mortals. 
So this is something that must be shaded in in order for me to accurately represent all humans or mortals. Now let's do the second one using some red. Now you notice it's an A statement, it's a universal affirmative, so I'm going to be doing some shading again. All Greeks are humans. Here's a segment that's Greek but not human, so I'll be shading that. Se section 6 is also a section that's Greek but not human. So I'll be shading 6 and 7 here. Now I stop and I read slash interpret the argument. I say, has all Greeks are mortal in fact been diagrammed? The answer to that question is yes. Because the only sector in which there are possible members that are Greek are also ones that are both human and mortal. So in fact, all Greeks are mortal has been diagrammed. This one's valid. And a, and a further explanation if these sectors, 6 and 7, had not already been shaded out, we could not have determined that this argument was valid, because then there would be areas of, of question. We'd be unsure if there were, in fact, Greeks that didn't fit into the class of all things, both mortal and human. 